hello and welcome. And this is Parenting as a Hero's Journey. We are uh, about in the middle of our journey. Actually, we're beginning the uh, ascent upwards uh, on, our, on our wheel. And I get the pleasure of being with Michael Mendiza for this, the next three weeks. We're gonna be talking about transcendent mentoring, which I'm really intrigued by. And the conversation, just a little bit that we've had already has gotten me really intrigued and excited. Um, so Joe, um, Joseph Pierce is also uh, someone else we're gonna be talking about. He brings a lot of the piece of play and Michael has been working with Joe for quite a while now. So Michael Mendiza is an author, he's a documentary filmmaker, and he's founder of, the, of Touch the Future. And if you haven't checked out Touch the Future, it is an amazing archive of resources and videos and interviews. And so um, I'm just really, really delighted to be here with you tonight, Michael. And IU, thanks you for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to the journey. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and this is really all about the journey. And um, so we're going to be talking about transcendent mentoring with you for the next three weeks. So tell us a little bit about transcendent mentoring. It sounds like this giant, you know, jumble of words that, you know, we might not know exactly what that means. So let's start there. What are we going to be talking about? Well, Joe wrote a book called The Biology of Transcendence, and it was one of his great, great works. And in that, he basically was saying that, that transcendence is our birthright. Transcendence is our nature. So the definition of transcendence is overcoming limitation and constraint. Mm. The entire evolutionary process is transcendent. The whole, the whole wild card of the genome and of, of the genetic structure, we now know that, that genetics is not locked in, that, that, that nature built in wild cards that, that uh, read the environment and then cause the genetic expression to, to alter itself based on, this is the whole epigenetic, ep, epigenetics um, yes. Field. So the, the whole gene is, is looking at the environment, scanning the environment, and adapting new responses based on that. So that's transcendence, basically. That's the idea of transcendence, overcoming limitation and constraint. So mentoring is, is ideally what parenting is about. A mentor, you're a mentor. You're not the boss. You're not the, the dictator. Um, you're a mentor. That's, that's really what ideally it would be. If you're a boss, you're, you're going to have conflict. If you're a dictator, the other people, meaning your children, will feel repressed. Their authentic nature is not being looked at, is not being valued. They're not being seen for who they really are. They're being seen in the eyes of what you expect them to be etc. So you have conflict built in many of the various parenting models. Right. So mentoring is, is ideally what a, what a parent is. Now mm -hmm. the mentor has to adapt their, I mean the mentor is really big. You're an adult, you've grown through all these ages and stages and now you're dealing with somebody who's rather finite. They're limited because they're only a year old or they're five years old. So you have to adapt your mentoring to the specific age and, and stage that that child is at. So that's a big challenge. You can't treat the five-year-old like a 20-year-old. You, you have to change your whole, you have to morph into a five-year-old and deliver your, your message at a five-year-old um, equation if you want to look at it that way. Hmm. So, so now, you, there's no formula. You can't be fixed in your parenting approach. Right because the child is moving every day. They're changing every day. They're a different age today than they were yesterday. And what they're interested in is different than it was then. And then we, we adulterated adults, adulterated adults, <laughs> we come with rather fixed, fixed things, you know, do it this way. This is how it's supposed to be done. That is not a transcendent and it's not a mentor. It's a dictator and with fixed, you know, you're fixed and rigid in your patterns and you have this very dynamic, fluid changing, wonderful child who's exploding with new, and they are transcendent, right? Their whole nature is transcendent. We're not. 
Hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, well, it makes perfect sense. Right? We're stuck in, right. our adult, in our adulterated belief systems and our patterns and our habits and what the culture is going to think of us if we do it wrong, et cetera, et cetera. We got all this stuff that freezes us into these kind of rigid stone-like creatures. And you have this dynamic learning changing uh, child who's exploding with new newness. Well, if you look at those two entities, obviously they're going to clash. They're, they're, they're not going to surf. I, lo I love the idea of surfing or dancing together, right? Yeah. Because even tango, I love tango. My son, John Michael, loves tango because it's improv. It's, it's not a yeah. fixed pattern. You have, to, you have to make it up as you go along. Yeah. Well, that is coming close to what this transcendent mentoring is all about. Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. That 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 gives me such a, a a clear image of what we're talking about because, you know, I I look at my I have an eleven year old and he is so much that he's still so curious and open and he's he's so present and and I really have had to adapt a lot to parent him for who he is and 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 it is a dance and every day is different. But we don't have a map for that, and that's that's uh, that's what we want to be talking about today. Is all right. That sounds really, really awesome. There's no map. There's no map. <laughs> so what do we do? No <laughs> How do we start? <laughs> There's no map. That's another wonderful thing. I love that. You know, we want a map, but there is no map. Yeah. Right. There is no map. So yeah. give up the map. Give it up. Right. <laughs> Forget the map. Forget it, because that's conformity. The map means that you're trying to get the child to conform to a particular rigid pattern. Right. And, now, and I, yeah, and that's hard. That's really hard for parents, um, you know, to, to well, what do you, what do you even mean by that? How do we give it all up? Do we just let them do whatever they want? How, how do we, how do we just follow them? How do we, how do we learn? How do we, how do we start to let go of our cultural beliefs, our attitudes, all that stuff we've learned so we can actually really be with them? How do we start? You, you bring up a, 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 you brought up culture. Now, this is really an important, this is, this is a very important um, piece of this pie or this puzzle, this quest. Now, what is culture? I was just reading, I am reading a book called Sapiens, which is a brief history of human beings. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this new author, which is really quite well done, he said, we, we have the capacity to imagine, this is a this is a core capacity that changes us from all most other species is our capacity to imagine, and woven into that is language, symbols, and metaphors. Imagination, symbols, and metaphors are really a, a dynamic one whole field. They're not separate things. Language and metaphor and story and imagination are all woven together. So culture is a story. Culture is a story. It's a particular story for the Native Americans. It's different for the Japanese. They all have different stories. And, and basically, there is the, the right way and the bad way of doing everything woven into each of those stories. Right. So what's okay in Japan is not okay in Germany in terms of how you dress and what you eat and how you speak and it's all the story which is all part of imagination language and metaphor those are all and culture are all woven into these things culture like with fairy tales and all of that there's a big bad person and there's a good person so right. <laughs> you've, got, you've got the right way and the wrong way it's woven into culture is this is this story so the thing that most people don't appreciate or don't know or realize is that their personal identity, who they think they are, who they have, the image that they've created about themselves as they looked into the mirror of that culture, which was being expressed by their parents and their tribe and their neighbors, right? All the neighbors, they all want you to do it this way. If you show up with red hair, that isn't okay. And the whole culture is going to look at you and, you know, disown you and cast, you know, cast you out, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So culture is all of these right, wrong patterns that you have to obey to in order to belong to the culture. 
Now we sculpt, etch our identity out of that, out of looking in that mirror of, am I accepted? What will they think of me? Parents, you know, you're a good little boy. You're a bad little boy. You know, do it, do it this way. Do it for mommy. I love that. You know, <laughs> eat vegetables for mommy. <laughs> Why would I want to eat my vegetables for mommy? I mean, there's, that's coercion. That's a reward. You know, if you do, what if I don't, what if I spit them out, right? Then mommy's going to not be happy. So etc. Personality, what we call personality and our self image is a coping mechanism to help us adapt to the cultural story, right? And that becomes a fixed set of patterns and that's what we call parenting. Hmm. Are, is the right. cultural patterns of right and wrong that have been woven into our identity. So, and, and we want our child to reflect what's right about our identity culture and not reflect what's, what we think is bad about our identity and culture. The, the, the problem with all of that is, is that culture is by its very nature, a little tiny slice. We have literally infinite potential to learn and to grow and to actualize. Culture says, no, only, only develop this little bandwidth. We want everybody to be blue. We don't want everybody to be full spectrum. We just want them to be blue. Right. And if you're pink or if you're mauve or green, you're, you don't fit. You don't belong. And we're going to throw you out and, and cast you away. We will reject you, abandon you if you don't conform. All right, so now right. that's parenting. Right. That's parent. That's schooling. Schooling follows the same model, right and wrong, mm -hmm. all of it. The whole culture is based on comparison, punishment, reward. You're good if, if you obey and conform, then you're good, you get the trophy. If you don't, you're a bad guy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole cultural story is really woven and set up to, to keep us constrained and limited within very tight boundaries. That's what culture and our personal identity is. So now let's go back to the word transcendence. To transcend is to overcome limitation and constraint. And touch back again to our full spectrum uh, potential. So, in the hero's journey. This is the essence of the hero's journey. Right. I wrote in my little paper, the introduction, I, this is the essence of the hero's journey. What is, what is it that, is, that the hero is going away from to discover something new? He has to leave his home. Right. That's the first step in the journey, is to leave your home. The home is what? The home is culture. The, and my identity. I have to leave my identity, which is that culture, in order to step out into the unknown. And in that way, I can touch and discover and see who I really am. And that discovery then, I actualize new potentials. And ideally, in the, in the Campbell structure of the hero's journey, I end up coming back to my culture and transforming the culture. That's the full circle. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big deal. So anyway, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big cycle. Deal. And what I'm trying to get here is that we're, what, what needs to be transcended in the hero's journey and in transcendent parenting is our very identity, who we think we are. And that's a, that's a big deal. That is a huge deal. Yeah, then but it's, who are we? But it's, it's actually really easy. So that let's not make it too daunting. It's actually really okay. easy. All right. It's not it's not hopeless or you know. You have my attention. <laughs> well, okay. So when I say it's not, it's it's challenging. It it is challenging if we are stuck in the identity culture. Right. If we if if we remain stuck there, then trying to get out of there. Is like fighting a tar baby, you know, it's just, it's really hard. We yeah. can't, you know, we just get all messy and we get confused and so on and so forth. Children are, by their very nature, transcendent. Ashley Montague wrote 51 books on what it means to be a human being. 
one of my favorites, I didn't read all 51, but I read a number of them. And one of my favorites is a book called Growing Young. In Growing Young, Ashley talks about the, what he calls the genius of childhood, the genius mm -hmm. of childhood. And he, he didn't really talk about it in terms of content. This is another big idea, big, big, you know, this is a star that we need to look at here is that we've been deeply conditioned to look at content, you know, to the content. You know, if you're a genius, you know a lot of stuff. Well, that isn't what a genius, a genius doesn't know a lot of stuff. A genius is able to go outside of the box and look at things in different ways and see things that most people don't see. Right. That's the genius is being able to see beyond to transcend <laughs> the norm, right? And see, see what's obvious, but everybody else is blind because they're, 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 they're locked into their little patterns. Right. So the genius of childhood actually defined not in terms of content, but in terms of capacity. So he said, one of the elements of um, the genius of childhood is 100% of attention, giving 100% of attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about your 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. well, I'm looking at Carly Elizabeth, who's 11, 13 months now. Man, what is she, that's, she's 100% into whatever it is. Now, it may, she may change rapidly and be 100% into the glasses and then 100% over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's 100%. Yes. Now, so that's one, one capacity, you know, complete attention. We'll come back to this because it's a really important fact. Mm -hmm. Another one is wonder, hmm. curiosity, being curious. What is this? How does that work? Opening the door a thousand times. You know, <laughs> Carly takes the lids off and puts the lids on. Anything that has a lid, she's messing around with, trying to get it on and so on and so forth. So curiosity and wonder. Willingness to try. So she gets frustrated, but she's willing, willing to try over and over and over again. When she was learning how to stand up on two feet, this, I mean, this was relentless. I mean, she just was up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. It wasn't work. Right. This was not work for her. This was, this is just what you do. <laughs> <laughs> this is a job. Right. This is how you do it. So willing, willingness to risk and to try, there's no failure in the genius of childhood. Joe brought this out in, in one of his talks about the nature of play. There's no failure in real play. There's no, there's no failure here. Mm. She did, as she fell down didn't mean that she failed. <laughs> right. That wasn't a failure on her part. That was just that experience. So no failure. Right. There's a quality of affection. There's a deep sense of relationship, connection, willingness. To, there's great trust. There's willingness to risk. Willingness to risk. Um, it, so now if you take the, these are all individual capacities. Wonder is different than willingness to risk. But when you group all of those together, you get a good idea of the state of the person who is in a state called genius. Genius right. isn't content. Genius is, is a state of relationship, how I'm relating to this. So that's another, remember we mentioned content, right? We're yeah. into a content orientation. What I want us to do is to realize that content is, is the byproduct of of your work or of your state it's the con content is the consequence of your state mm -hmm. not the goal what you want to do is you want to be in the best possible state when you meet each moment make sense yes makes for you don't want to be hung over you don't want to be you know in a grumpy mood you don't want to be tired you don't want to be hungry you don't want to be afraid you don't want to worry about what your mom's going to say or the neighbor's going to say because, you know, whatever it is. So you don't have any of that. You have a complete attention. You're curious. Um, you're willing to look at things in a brand new way. These are all states. It's actually something called state-specific learning. 
We know about stage specific learning that, you know, when you're five is different when you're 15. Right. Those are but what, what's actually more fundamental is something called state specific learning. Now, basically, the whole goal of human development is to optimize the state you're in so that you're in the best possible state most of the time. Athletes call it the zone. Right. Right? They know that if they're in the zone, the likelihood of that ball or that or them skiing or them performing or whatever they're doing, if they're in the zone, content will take care of itself. Right. But if they're, if they're afraid, if they're anxious, if their attention's scattered, blah, 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 their performance is going to go down. So they don't care about the score. They care about being in the optimum state and then wherever, whatever the challenge is, they're ready. So it's creating the conditions for that to happen. It's creating the conditions for optimum to happen. Yes. Yes. Right. Now, again, if you're hungover, if you're angry, you're not going to respond in an optimum way. Your, your whole response, which means the content of your life is going to go down because the state you're in is fragmented and broken and not the genius of childhood. Right. Now, what, the, what children call the genius of childhood is play. That's the word that they use, I'm playing. And it's only in play, real play, what's called original play, Fred Donaldson coined the phrase original play 25 or 30 years ago. That's different from cultural play, which is competition. Competition is back to comparison. You're good, you win, you lose. Right. This is a cultural. This is a cultural trap to reinforce culture's hold over your identity and therefore your behavior. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The yes. whole role of culture is to control you. Right. That's the function of the function of culture is to control you and keep you in the little blue box. Transcendence is getting out of the blue box and being a rainbow, which mm -hmm. is what you were born as, and what play takes you back to, re-discovers, re re-invites, re-embodies, right? You connect back to your authentic nature, which is play, instead of trying to conform to the good and the bad that the culture is imposing and you have identified with. Right. That's where the identity deal comes in. There's no, you can't separate culture from identity. They're two sides of the same coin. I use the metaphor of looking through a telescope, right? When you look up through one end of the telescope, it's like a microscope and you see close up and you spin it around, then it looks like big, right? So right. culture is the big end of the telescope. My identity is the opposite, which is the, the yeah. macro and the micro, right? Yeah. So, so your, uh, your cultural identity is what the transcendent hero's journey is has to transcend or go beyond in order to reconnect to your authentic nature. Now, how do we get this into parenting, right? Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> right? That's the deal. Yeah. That, now you've got the paradigm, you've got the you've got the the challenge, right? Yes. So I mentioned it, you know, it, it really is about play. Play is transcendent by its very nature. Tra play is nature's agenda or nature's design for optimum learning and performance at any age and any activity. I'll say that again. Play yeah. is nature's design for optimum learning and optimum performance at any age or any activity. The zone, again, play is a state, not an activity. Right. The zone is a state, not, the, not hockey or golf, right? The zone is, is the, what Tim Galloway would call the inner game. He wrote a series of sports psychology books called The Inner Game of Tennis was his first one. Well, then golf and inner game of basketball or the inner game of cooking or whatever it's going to be. So you have the inner game, which is the state you're in, as you play the outer game, which happens to be tennis or making love or dancing or writing a story or whatever it is. So you have two games going on, the inner game and the outer. If you optimize the inner game, the outer game takes care of itself. If you neglect the inner game, then you're at the whims and 
and the whims of the of the culture's interpretation of the outer game. Right. So, so play is the essence of the hero's journey, and it's the essence as a state. The state you want to be in is playful. As a parent. Now, the kid's already playful. They're, they're born into play until we rub it out of them, right? Mm -hmm. Erase it out of them, condition it out of them. Right. All of these things, their curiosity, their wonder, their attention, all of that, they have it. Imagine what it would be like if you, as a parent, left your, your adulterated, if you went on a hero's journey as a parent every time you met your child. Hmm. right mm -hmm. you're going to leave you're going to leave you're going to transcend and leave behind all of these boundaries and so on which are very small very narrow little cookie cutter kind of behavior reflexive you know there's no david Bohm, the physicist said there was no intelligence in a reflex right the knee jerk right there's no intelligence there it's just a knee jerk right most parenting is just a knee jerk it's not in most most parenting is a knee jerk Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a knee jerk, right? It's yeah. just, it's a reflex, right? right? This is the way it has to be done. Do it this way. And the poor kid says there's an infinite way to do it. So if you left your, if what we have to see, we, we've been taught that, that if we, if we, that our survival is dependent on staying inside the blue box. Right. Our whole survival is dependent on that. And right. If, if you step out of the blue box, you're dead, right? You're, you're, you're out, you're, so we've been, we're afraid to step out of the blue box because our whole identity and life depends on it. But the, the, the trick is, is that that's not true. That's an illusion. Rainbows have a million more options than blue does. So your ability to actually be intelligent and respond appropriately and deeply and, and creatively and intelligently and sensitively would be a rainbow, being a rainbow, not just blue, right? Right. So there's a lie. Culture's lying to us saying that you should always be blue and you shouldn't be a rainbow. But that's what it's telling you. Right. Grades are telling you that. The coach is telling you that. The school's telling you that. Your parents are the blue ribbons. Alfie Cohen wrote a book, Punishment by Rewards. All of that, he's, he's, you know, he was so brilliant in that work. Yeah. So you have to step out. So you want to go on the hero's journey every time that your child is, that you're with the child. And by doing that, you're setting aside the limitations and constraints imposed by the culture, and you're reconnecting with your, with your, with your rainbow capacities and then your natural intelligence is going to be infinitely more subtle infinitely more appropriate you're going to be responding to who the child actually is instead of your projections of what you want them to be right which is what the blue box is imposing right so they're going to feel seen they're going to feel trusted because that you they know that you're seeing really them and not what they're not right they're going to trust you so when you say, oh, darling, we need to be careful, they'll trust you, not out of dogma, but because they trust your intelligence, that this is a new moment and we need to be extra careful. It eliminates no, you, all, I, you don't need to say no. No is almost an unnecessary, becomes obsolete. Saying no to a child is crazy. Talk more about that. Like, you know, that's such a conditioned thing, but what do you mean? How could you never say no? I can just hear the parents saying that. What do you mean? <laughs> There's no no. You basically lead by modeling. You model, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're connected, you're surfing again. You're dancing with them. They trust you, right? It's not mechanical, but it's always fresh. Your relationship is fresh, and they trust that implicitly. They're, and, you're, and, you're, and they see that how you're relating to the world is intelligent, it's, it's, it's coherent, it's sane, it's a, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good way to behave. They trust it. So again, when, 
you almost you almost don't even have to talk mm. because you're you're modeling it every day in how you behave. You don't have to explain to them, do it this way, oh, do it this way, or if you don't, you know, that's all cognitive business. Right. How you're relating to the world and how you're demonstrating and how you're playful in the way that and joyful in how you're relating to the postman and the puppy dog and the flower and whatever you're doing, vacuuming, right? They see that this is filled with joy and creativity and it's fun. And why wouldn't they want to participate and be with somebody like that? So they trust it. Um, I'll tell a story about my son, John Michael, who's now 30. John Michael became fascinated with knives when he was three and a half or four years old. Now, I don't know why, but he did. Um, so I never took the knife away from him. I used to be a carver. I mean, I used to work at a cafeteria and cut all, so I'm very handy with knives. And he would sit on the counter and we would cut tomatoes. And this is a pretty sharp knife if you're gonna cut tomatoes. Yeah. And, and I would give him the knife. This is three and a half. I gave him the sharp knife at three and a half. He watched how I did it. And then he did it. He knew that that blade was sharp. I mean, maybe there was a couple of saying, ah, you don't want to do this, you know, to sh demonstrate. Right. John, John Michael is now, like I said, he's 30 years old. He only, he's only cut himself with a knife once in his whole life. And I never told him no. And I asked him when he was 20, you know, I said, John Michael, can you remember any time me telling you no? And he couldn't, he couldn't think of any time that I ever told him no, especially in a punitive way. Right. Don't do that, right? No. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time that that would be appropriate, in my view, is in a, in a real emergency. You know, mm -hmm. there's a car spinning out or there's some, there's some emergency where you really have to, have, to, have to step in and grab the kid or do something that's, you know, out of an emergency. But the, the emergencies are pretty rare. Right. And this is based on this playful relationship. If you're in sync with, if you, the adult, are in this play optimum, let's take the word play for a minute and, and replace it with optimum. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. Play has a bad connotation. Play means frivolous. Play means a waste of time. Play means not serious. Right. Optimum means the best possible. But they're the same, right? Hmm. That they're actually synonyms. They're the same. Play is optimum. Optimum is play. In the video we're going to be looking with Joe, the name of it is play is learning. Hmm. It's not play to learn or learning or blah, blah, you know, learning is not separate from play. Play is learning. That's the big deal. So optimum is play. Play is optimum. And it doesn't matter whether you're five or whether you're 50. And it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, this shot is the Stanley Cup or, or, or you're just all by yourself in the forest, right? It doesn't matter. It's still optimal. So, opt, you know, the goal is, to, is for the adult to reconnect with their playfulness to, or their optimum state. And that's, that's, the, big, that's the big step. Yeah, that's the hard thing. You know, I, I work with a lot of parents and, you know, I start talking about play and they, oh, I don't know how, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Pam Leo and she was saying, you know, she was well into her 50s before she learned how to play. It's, right. it's so conditioned out of us that we don't even know where to begin. I remember I saw a picture of um, Pam Leo on the floor with a ball. And she was with, um, she, it, was a, it was a whole workshop about parents learning how to play. And right. there she was. And it was this beautiful moment of, oh, <laughs> here we are. So where do we start? That sounds scary to some people, I know. Well, again, here's, here's let's go back to complete attention, right? Yes. Let's not try to give you a formula because the mm -hmm. formula isn't, the, that, that's back into the intellect, right? Right. 
the intellect is not necessarily playful. It could be with math or some other kinds of things you can actually be playful with, with, with abstract concepts, but we're not there. We're actually saying how do we reconnect with our playful, our play nature, our optimum nature. Right. So we have to go back to capacities, not content. So, let, so if we're going to embody optimum, which is play, mm -hmm. I already listed the, the key components. Right. Are you playing? Are you are you completely present? Now, one of the most fascinating things in my life has been three different people saying the same thing differently. Mm -hmm. One of them was Krishnamurti, the philosopher or teacher. He said, "With complete attention, there's no observer." Now, the observer is your cultural identity. Right. Everything we just talked about. Mm -hmm. With complete attention, and this is basically what all the athletes are after. They want to just be able to completely just hit the ball. They don't want to be worrying about how it's going to land or whether it's going to hit the ball or whether it's the how many birdies or whatever it is. Right. All, they, all they want to do is just hit the ball. And that requires complete attention. Well, it's really quite hard to pay complete attention. It is. <laughs> Monks spend years in the cave and, you know, I mean, this is pay paying complete attention. Unfragmented attention is a huge issue. But children do it naturally because they're playing. So can you, can, when you're with your child, can you suspend worrying about the bills and what time it is and what you know you have to you have to you have to just be with the kid and 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 you could anyway so being able to give complete attention negates in that moment what you're trying to tr transcend does that make sense you're mm -hmm. trying to transcend the cultural boundaries right. when you play when you pay complete attention to what you're doing all of that cultural stuff disappears. It's gone. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Because you're paying attention, right? So that's one easy thing a parent can do is that mm -hmm. they, I walk down the street daily and watch all these mothers pushing their babies in strollers, texting. Mm -hmm. And I'm horrified by it. Because the kids isolated all by themselves, the mom's off in some abstract thing. She's not even paying attention to the telephone pole she's almost running into. Right. right? So she's completely lost and disassociated and disconnected and habitually so. So that's not play. Play would be being right there with the present with the kid. I, when I push Carly in the little stroller, rarely when we do, because I would prefer to hold her than put her in the car carriage. I walk by the side of it so she can see me mm -hmm. instead of behind it where she can't. So I want to maintain relationship with her all the time. Mm -hmm. Then she feels connected. We're dancing again. But if I'm walking behind her and she's off in a stoop or someplace and I'm texting, there's no play. So then comes curiosity, you know, are you curious? Are you open? Are you looking? Are you sensitive to what's around you, etc.? So let me go back to Krishnamurti when he said, with complete attention, there's no observer. I mentioned Fred Donaldson. Fred Donaldson, years ago, my first interview, he said, when I play, Fred disappears. Hmm. Krishnamurti just said that last week. <laughs> I didn't know that. But Fred just said exactly the same thing in a different context that the philosopher Krishnamurti was saying. And I said, Fred, what is it? That, what's Fred? So I said, Fred, what's Fred? What disappears? And he said, all the categories that I live my life in. Hmm. Male, PhD, tall, smart, dumb, fat, girl, boy, all the labels. With right. complete attention, all that goes away in that moment. Now, then I picked up a book called Flow. This was 1990. Mahali Chikstin Mahali wrote it. He's a, he's a psychiatrist, psychologist. And he then was in Chicago. He wrote a book called The Psychology of Optimum Experience. Mm -hmm. And he said, 
the hallmark of optimum is when the athlete or the performer gives complete attention to what they're doing, that there's no attention left over to reflect back and worry about how you're doing it while you're doing it. Right. Or to be distracted by anything else. With complete attention, there's no distraction. There's no observer. There's no culture. You're just there. So that's a clue. That's something that parents can do. They can just simply be present while they're walking to the store with their kid instead of texting. Mm -hmm. um, trying new things. Hmm. Uh, so an, an example, just this morning, again, I'll use Carly as a great example. We just got out of the shower. She's all dried off. Um, I love to throw her on the bed when she's just right out of the bath. She loves it. She falls on the thing. Well, today, I grabbed the comforter and I yanked it, which flipped her in a circle. She flipped over like a somersault because I pulled the rug out from underneath her. <laughs> she loved it. And we, played, we just did this over and over again for a little while. This was a brand new thing. I hadn't done it, right? This was a brand new spontaneous thing. If I was worried about what time it was and had an agenda and didn't have the space or the leisure to be able to kind of mess around a little bit, I wouldn't do that, and it would be, let's time to get dressed, it's da 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 da, -da. Um, Right. So, the, uh, so taking your cues from the child is actually, you have, let me go back, you have the best guru, you have the best teacher, you have the best, you don't have to go to school, you don't have to sit on the floor with some stupid adult with balls trying to get you to play. <laughs> you just have to go and, 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 resonate with what your kid's doing. Are they building blocks? Or maybe, you know, I, for another example. So um, I went down to the grocery store, the whole food store, whatever it was, and I bought 20 pounds of organic kidney beans. It's a lot of kidney beans. <laughs> it's a lot of kidney beans. <laughs> I, pour, I poured them in, I poured them in a, a turkey pan, you know, a big turkey roasting pan. Yeah. And I got this, I got this from Bev Boss, the preschool teacher that we'll meet later in the video. But what could you do? We can pick them out, we can put them in a bottle, we can throw them all over the place. I mean, for months, Carly has been playing with the kidney beans. They're all over the place every day. <laughs> She's around with them. Um, instead of Legos right? Legos are kind of, she can do Legos, but she's only 13 months. So this yeah. kidney being early stage of Legos and so on. So me being able to suspend all of my adult stuff, my worries and my fears, if I'm with her, I need to not, I need to just be with her and not try to be doing three times, three other things. No phones. I don't carry a phone with me when I'm with her. I don't even turn on the computer if she's around. I wait till she's not around to do my computer time. Um, in the book that I wrote with Joe Pierce called Magical Parent, Magical Child, which is really about this whole theme, we had, we had you know, take your cues from the child. Take your, you've got the best teacher in the world right there. No other teacher can come close to modeling what play is than your child. So as the Bible said, unless you become, can become as a little child, you can't enter the kingdom. Now the kingdom is not some abstract thing. The kingdom is joy. The kingdom is happiness. The kingdom is being a whole human being. That's the kingdom. It's not some place up there. It's the rainbow. It's the rainbow, exactly. <laughs> So well, that's, you know, there it is right in the Bible, except we mistaken it by, by the comic book characterization of up in heaven. Heaven is, is joy. Right. Heaven is, heaven is living in the zone. Heaven is optimum. And that translates into play. So play, which is a state, not content. So the main part of what our journey is going to be for anybody who's interested is understanding what play is and what play is not. And once they have a deep appreciation for what play is, they can, they can go there more. The, perfect, the top athletes actually pay, pay their elite coaches 
tens of thousands of dollars so that they could simply hit the ball, and which is simply to play. If they could just go out and play because they love it, they right. know they're going to do better than if they're trying to compete. Mm -hmm. So they have to decondition. They pay their they pay their psychologists and all that kind of stuff to get them back into authentic play. So because they know they're going to do better that way. So the, like I said, the, the parents have the ideal teacher right there because they love them. Just do that. Right. Another little hint. Another is this okay to go on? I mean, another mm -hmm. little hint. Another little hint is. Um, because prediction and control is the hallmark of the being blue, the little blue box that right. we think we are, right? So what's the opposite of that? It's expect the unexpected. Don't, don't be thrown by the unexpected, but expect the unexpected. What a nice thing. Oh my gosh, I never expected that to happen. But we don't take it as a change. We don't take it as that that's bad. We say, oh my gosh, this is a new, th I never expected that to happen. So expect the unexpected. Um, we haven't gone into story, but storytelling and story is a huge, huge part of, of play. Imagination is all play. The whole imaginative field is play. And you, you play with words. That's what stories are. So learning how to tell stories spontaneously on the lap in the car this is pure play for that child and its relationship is back to dancing and you but you need to it's really hard to make up a fresh story mm -hmm. it's hard we can mimic disney and all that stuff really easy but to come up with a fresh story and to do it day by day is a huge meditation it really takes a lot of work you need to really be present and and your imagination has to be rekindled and revitalized in order to do that. Well, what a great thing for you. You get to grow your, you get to reconnect it through your imagination that you left at the door, at the office door, right? Right. So, you know, now you become a bigger person, a better person, a more whole person because you're pulling out new things because you love your child. So by mentoring your child in this transcendent way, you grow and you also liberate your child at the same time. What better story is that? So there's, there were seven or eight of these kinds of little hints and you know, we can post them in the, in the draft or whatever it is so people can you know, see what they are. But storytelling is a big one. Um, reinventing yourself, renewing yourself, not being fixed and rigid, um, um, expecting the unexpected and so on and so on and so on. Hmm. What else, what else were we going to talk about? Well, so let's talk a little bit more about Joseph Pierce because some people may not be familiar with him or his work. So sure. tell us a little bit. Sure about him and he's got he's such an amazing person he's done such amazing work um i talked with joe the other day just a couple days ago he's 89 pushing 90. <laughs> i met him maybe 30 years ago and we we actually have a lot in common i mean we our interests are are unique i'm i could be his son um but we just found that we were quite taken and interested in very similar things. And that was part of this bond or, um, you know, I, I consider myself the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, and that's how I see myself. I've been so taken by his work. There's nobody who has, no one has done what Joe has done as an author. And that is to author something, to describe something, to tell a story. And his story is, a blending of what we call spirituality and biology. Hmm. He doesn't take spirituality out of biology or biology and separate it all, but, but they are woven together. And, and then his, his thing is what we've been talking about. How does culture, how do we embody culture? We embody culture as spontaneously as we do language. We didn't learn language. 
we just absorbed it like Maria Montessori describes. We yeah. just soaked it up and did it. Well, we, we adopt culture in the same way, which means we are, we are limiting and constraining ourselves to the color blue or the red box or whatever it is. We do this automatically. It's just, we don't think about it. It's not a choice. And Joe's whole work is to say that the rainbow in terms of capacities is much broader than whatever is in the blue box. And what is that? And it's really actually miraculous. Our capacities as human beings far, far outstrip what we actualize because of, because of wanting to be conform, to conform to blue or to red. So he, in my first interview with him about this, he described it as his fascination with our amazing capacities, which is our rainbowness, and self-inflicted limitations, which is the blue. Now, his entire life's work has been an exploration of that. All the way back to his first book, Cracking the Cosmic Egg, that was the one that kind of opened everything up and said there are, we have miraculous capacities. All the things that superheroes can do and we think are fantasies are not fantasies. I wrote a couple of essays saying that, that, uh, that attention is telepathic. Mm. When we give our attention to our children, when we're attending to our children, there's shared meaning, which is being transferred and shared telepathically, what we would call telepathic. Right. This is something that superheroes can do. They, get, they, they can get messages from across the way and they don't need a cell phone. Right. But, but so do we. Right. But we're so busy being blue that we've obliterated that capacity. We have not developed that capacity because the limitations and constraints that blue and that, that our, soul, our cultural identity imposes on us. So Joe had a number of experiences that, that should not have happened to somebody who was a blue person. Mm -hmm. That's the crack in the cosmic egg. The crack in his identity was that something did happen that said, oh my God, I'm not just this little limited thing that I thought I was. I'm hugely bigger. What is that? What, how big am I? He asked. Hmm. And what keeps me from being that? And now you have the core, his exploration of that, which is our whole development as human beings. And as he said, our, our amazing capacities and self-inflicted limitations. So he's, he's taken it, he's, he's looked at this in an expansive way, well beyond what anybody else has ever done. In, with contemporary science, with biology, with brain work. And um, every book has been new and different, uh, pushing, pushing this quest just a little further. So, um, and, I, and I've been interviewing him for the last 20 years. So the, the, the Academy at Touch the Future has 30 hours of interviews with this guy. Wow. Where he, co he covers all of this. I mean, all of this is now well-documented, accessible, everybody should be spending their time listening to Joe in the Academy. I mean, this is, this is a, this is a rare history. He's, he's quite rare and quite historical in, in this way. So Amazing. that's Joe. Yeah. 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 And so next week, everyone is going to have access to uh, one of the interviews, the, um, the one you were talking about um, a yeah. few minutes ago. And so well, you let's also, describe, go ahead. Okay, let's, let's describe that for them. What, what we're going to do. Um, again, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and what I have really enjoyed doing, you know, you, you know, Bill Moyers, he does interviews with people. Well, I've, you know, I've just gone around and knocked on people's door and say, let's talk about what you're passionate about. And this has been going on for years. So I keep doing that. I'm going to do a bunch more. So it's just that's I'm like the Bill Moyers of the human development field. It's just a lot of fun to do that for me. Yeah. So. so I did an interview with Joe on play and play happens to be the big umbrella of the whole consciousness thing. The essence of human consciousness is actually play. The mm -hmm. essence of if in the most expansive way possible of when you, when you think about what it means to be a human being, playfulness is actually our, our, the under, the underpinning um, foundation of it. And that's what makes us so unique. Stuart Brown said, 
the more intelligent the species, the more they play. Hmm. And this is true. It's actually quite true. So we have a third, we have about a 40 minute video interview with Joe talking about play and its broadest spectrum. So this is the best, best vehicle to get grounded into what we mean by play. There's another video, it's an interview with Bev Boss. Bev is a national and internationally well-known preschool educator, early childhood educator. She's been doing it for 40 years. There's nobody who embodies play as learning as well as Bev and has created her whole environment around that premise. So we're gonna take a tour of Bev's preschool and we're gonna see how she has incorporated play as learning to create this rich, fabulous environment for, to, for children to flourish in. Um, so that's gonna be really practical. Joe gives you the theoretical, Bev puts you right in the sandbox and um, really quite good. And then there'll be a, a, a spattering of uh, interview clips with, I said, Fred Donaldson, mm -hmm. who's an a play researcher. Fred is quite well known because he's been spending the last 50 years now traveling the world playing with wild children, meaning autistic children, special needs kids, and so on, and wild animals, all the way from bison to rhinos and lions and bears and dolphins and so on and so forth. He literally has gone out into the wild um, to look for playmates. Wow. So with that foundation, we can then come back on the, the last session that we have and we can explore various aspects of this question of how can parents rediscover this playful state and be in that more and more as they go through all the ages and stages of their, of, with their kids. Mm. I am so excited. I, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I want to play. <laughs> I'm ready. Yay. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. I, I am quite so grateful and I have so enjoyed this conversation. I have so many exciting uh, thoughts going through my head and, and integrating and processing and, and I want to go play with my 11 year old. <laughs> so <laughs> well, it felt a little bit like a monologue. I'm sorry if I just blabbed too much and just went on and on. But um, anyway, that's no, you, you have you have so much um, you, you did a, a wonderful job of explaining what you were talking about of relating it and sharing stories. And so I, I didn't feel the need to, to jump in too much. So it was beautiful and perfect. And, and I'm just very, very grateful. Thank so, you so much. Yes. Yep. So watch for your emails. You're going to be receiving emails that um, guide you through this process. You're going to be receiving uh, three times a week an email that has something to think about from Michael. And next week you'll be receiving access to the videos. So I encourage you to set aside time so that you can really watch it, really digest it. And then we'll be coming back together in the, the middle of the third week and we'll be uh, checking back in and, and having a conversation about those videos. Yeah. So, all right. So Thanks until next time, thank you, Michael.